Acesta este Curious Nine Podcast, prezentat de ING. Hello and welcome to the Curious Ryan podcast brought to you by ING Bank. I am Vedan Andriescu and today we have a special episode with Tara Hunt. And we're going to talk with her about communication, the pandemic, what has changed during this time. It will be a very interesting episode, uh, also on video, if you are watching on YouTube. So sit tight in your chair, in your car or in your bed, wherever you're watching. Tara, nice to have you. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Before jumping into the the conversation, uh, let me tell you, uh, let me tell the people some things, some things about you. Um, so, so I'm I'm gonna read because I, I I'm not capable of uh, remembering uh, so many things. Tara is a digital uh, marketing native, meaning she's been working in digital since 1992 has over 19 years of experience in market research and strategy on both client and strategy aside. She is an author of a book released in seven languages worldwide and has been quoted in dozen books. Uh, she not only talks, um, she's building communities and this will be one of our subject subjects today. She is a LinkedIn influencer followed by uh, over 200,000 people and her slideshare presentation have been viewed over 1.7 million times. A bit overwhelming, Tara, <laughs> for, uh, for me. Um, so um, just to jump into the conversation a bit abruptly, um, I want to talk about, about the subject that everyone talks today, and it's not about the um, elections in the, in the U.S., <laughs> which are still happening as we are talking right now, but about the pandemic. So in your view, what has changed in the um, communication of the brands? What, what, what changes has the pandemic brought uh, during these times? Well, I mean, my short answer is that brands need to be or have, have found themselves needing to be way more empathetic than they were pre-pandemic. Um, really, really like listening rather than just speaking um, because almost everything sounds tone deaf now <laughs> if you aren't in real time listening and responding and um, being a good uh, social webizen, I guess is the, the term. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been a big change for brands, I think. You mentioned that brands should, should listen more. Um... How does a brand can listen more during during these times? Oh, well, I mean, for one, um, what I found over the years is like, as, I, as you were saying in my intro, you know, I'm a digital social native. So I've been part of like social web before it was called social and interacting in these different ways. And what I found is like over time as brands have adopted a lot of these social platforms, they've turned them into more broadcast or they, they had turned them into more broadcast platforms. Um, and so, you know, there was a proliferation of tools like, uh, um, uh, what is it? Hootsuite and CoSchedule and uh, like all these tools that allow brands to create these posts and schedule them and then just walk away. They just scheduled them and walked away. Um, that wasn't for me watching that was like not very social at all. It was very like, I am here just to amplify my voice, not to listen to you. Now there's a little bit of uh, customer service, I guess that was going on. So mm -hmm. if they were, if they were like at the brand name, they would list, they would reply to it within a certain amount of time, some better than others. But not very many were like actually just following and listening to their customers talk about what was going on in the world and what was going on for them and how what they were afraid of, what they were excited about. Um, and so those there's plenty of opportunities for companies to be listening to more than just their brand name mentioned. And I think during this pandemic, that is. Uh, a muscle group that a lot of brands have had to learn to uh, work on. You, you mentioned in an article you wrote on March 
31st that companies need emotional transformation to survive this pandemic. Your approach um, um, was about uh, uh, the company culture, the, the way that, that employee work uh, right now. You mentioned troubles with, with mental health, stress, pressure. We all know uh, from the last eight or um, nine months. So um, going a bit forward with this conversation about empathy, how do companies have to adapt to this period, not only when talking to the general public on a social platform, but also inside their company? Um, how do they talk with their employees? Yeah, so um, yeah, empathy and that whole emotional transformation um, piece came about because everybody was talking about a digital transformation, right? Oh, as we're all like moving a lot of us are moving to work from home and all this remote stuff, remote conferences. It's like, what digital tools? What, you know, we have to digitally transform. And But what I found when I looked around, and even in my own organization, was no matter how many digital tools you put into place, you know, people were still uh, doing this thing that we, this, this term that we have coined in 2020 called doom scrolling. Um, you know, they were still going online. They were seeing the bad news, one bad news piece after another bad news piece. They're worried about their health, the health of their family, uh, the state of the world, the state of their jobs. Like everything has been uncertain. I mean, even right now, as you mentioned in the intro, you know, we're in the middle of a U.S. election, which is no like usually, you know, you kind of know within the day of the election or at least uh, within a short amount of time. And this may be stretched out. So there's tons of uncertainty that, um, you know, we've been dealing with all of 2020. And that affects people's ability to focus on their work. And I think like the whole productivity, productivity push and the idea of like, digital transformation, really, a lot of that uh, is driven by productivity, getting more out of your workforce. Now you, you have to actually step back and think about the emotional parts of it, because human brains, we're not robots. <laughs> People don't just perform yeah. because a better tool is put in front of them. Sometimes there's things going on in our lives. And, and, and right now we're collectively suffering trauma over and over again. So that's where it's really important to go through an emotional transformation, to start thinking about how we work um, more effectively uh, like as humans than just as productive uh, members of the team. Yeah, indeed. And you mentioned the, the U.S. elections and I was uh, talking to people um, last few days that um, opening opening on CNN and it's still election night in America. And as we speak, <laughs> there are four days of election night in America, the longest night, if, yeah, if you were exactly. to make a, <laughs> a Game of Thrones yeah. uh, joke. Um, yeah. So going, going a bit back to, um, to this idea of communities, um, I, I um, read um, a blog post on Flywheel, um, your company's website, about the post-pandemic business model. And you mentioned some good examples of co online communities grew over um, during these months. Um, so we are almost a year into the pandemic. What are the wow. key points <laughs> that brands should know and apply to navigate these times and also to have a, a solid business model in the future because you you have to have continuity uh, after the the pandemic yeah well first of all when you say we're almost a year into the pandemic i was like wow okay <laughs> yeah. you're right i mean it is november and you know we started hearing um and uh, people in europe definitely started being affected by it in december and january so wow um yeah. Uh, so back to the the question, the communities that I talked about were, I mean, especially with local businesses, these communities that I talked about were really these survival techniques that a lot of these small local businesses were using in order to keep in touch with their clients, even if they can't come in. So one of the examples was like a local um, uh, aesthetic spa, somewhere where somebody would get a massage or facial. <laughs> and uh, 
um, they built this really cool online community because they couldn't service, you couldn't work on somebody's face during that time, right? And this kept a lot of uh, loyalty going for this business and they kept it top of mind um, and through that even though they weren't like push push pushing their products as part of this community it did have you know people come along and buy products in their new so they did do some digital stuff where they created this store this online store with their products and people you know their sales from that online store grew a ton because of that not because they were using it as a sales platform but because people were getting a lot of comfort in the community and they were doing fun stuff like that you know netflix um i think it's like the watch with me or whatever netflix uh plug-in that you had i even joined in one of them it was we watched dirty dancing and we put on face masks <laughs> so you know there was this package that they created that they were like if you're going to join us like you just ordered this little package and people shared um, drinks recipes and stuff. And it was like a fun, it was a really fun night. And it, um, you know, as soon as they opened up, they got a lot of business right away back because they had built trust. Um, and this is a question that has come up a couple of times in conversations is, is like, you know, if, if you're an event planner and I know, you know, you're, yeah. We're speaking because of an event. Um, if you are uh, a in-person brick and mortar store, how do you how do you keep those connections and build trust with your customer base so that as soon as they open up, you know they're they're going to trust you to be doing the right thing. And or if you do an in-person event, there's a trust built there. And that's really through community. And I don't think post-pandemic that's going to necessarily go away. People are going to remember this time for a long time. I think the way that we interact, it's going to be permanently adjusted. You know, we may, we're going to want to come back together, but we're going to be a lot more cautious for a long period of time. So I think it's going to be good for businesses and communities allow businesses to keep that communication up when it comes to, um, you know, building the, the, that trust. Yeah, it was a good, um, it was a, it was a difficult time for, for small, small companies, small businesses, but I think that, um, these times made them, uh, rethink the, the, the way they, they communicate. Maybe some of them didn't have, um, so a, a, a good online presence, a, a community. Um, so they, they were forced a bit to, to adapt and to go, to go online, not only just for sales, which is the, the end goal, but to, to build this trust, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. but I want to go to the start of trying to create a community and maybe, uh, thinking about small businesses that don't have a uh, marketing strategist, don't have a marketing team. They have maybe an owner um, and some, some employees. Um, where do you start? Uh, what's what's the, the key points when starting to build what you think it will be a community? Because you cannot just say it now, this is a community. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, well, I mean, where you start is where your customer is. And not everybody knows that out of the gate, right? A lot of people say, okay, great. You know, I want to build a community. I want to build a following, but I don't understand where my customer base is. And that's, you know, going back to what we were talking about before is this, the social listening. Um, there are your customers right now, you know, I'll say to people in the audience uh, who are listening to this, your customers right now are gathering somewhere online. They're sharing online they're having conversations they're bonding over uh various different affinities they're maybe even bonding over you know a love of something that you can provide right so um yeah you know you if you start listening you're gonna find out where they're at like you you know, t take that time, you know, start to don't think about joining Instagram or Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever you're, you're joining, or even like, if you go into like Reddit or um, TikTok or wherever you want to go, like, don't think about joining it to like, 
gain an audience first and foremost go to find where your people are gathering and that's basically where you start and then keep showing up and in and keep adding value to that conversation and then you can you know start putting putting forward your you know big ideas or you know your uh, slightly promotional posts like using your your product <laughs> if you're selling a product or talking about your new store or whatever and and but pepper that in still with providing a lot of value and, and having a lot of interaction you know I um, I've for a long time talked about social as being like it's a two-way interaction between like you know where both parties are are uh, offering and gaining from that interaction it's it's just like how social works in real life you can't expect to make friends by expecting everybody to pay attention to you and not to listen to them in real life so why as a brand would you expect anything different so once once you start to find that community um, of people who are already talking this is this is where you see the the early inklings of being able to build one in and around your brand you mentioned about the the platforms and i think that that one of the dif difficulties of of the people is uh, choosing the right platform right now mm -hmm. because you have Facebook as the, the biggest social network, but you have also Instagram. You mentioned about TikTok, um, which is which is growing. How do you find what you said, where the audience is, where you, you go to all these platforms and just try things and see what sticks? Well, or not just try things. You just go around, you, you are looking for things. Um, so, you know, what you're going to be wanting to do is go on to these platforms and search for terms that would be interesting in, to your customers. So, uh, in, you know, hashtags are a great place to start too. people at hashtag posts on most of the platforms. And, uh, so like, I don't know if, if you are. For instance, like we have uh, friends who have a streaming service for film festival, uh, uh, film festival movies. Uh, it's called Highball TV. And they can see that they know that like people who are really into film festival will use like the hashtags for the different film festivals or they will uh tag something like cinephile for instance saying like signaling to the world that they love um cinema uh, and they love like sort of uh film theory which is definitely in line and so they'll go and they'll look for those hashtags and if you see a lot of them you see a lot of conversation you see a lot of connections happening in an area um then that's where you're going to want to spend time listening and you know doing what i just talked about and it's funny because they found actually beyond and a lot of people don't think about reddit but they found the biggest deepest conversations about film theory on reddit people forget about reddit all the time it is a very passionate community and um, i also know like there's a huge science community on reddit um so uh if you know if you have a business that uh Uh, gets geeky into any topic don't discount uh, some of those edge networks where people are gathering like reddit out there too yeah, this is an interesting thing uh, you mentioned about platforms and uh, discovering them um, but also um, going a bit to the voice of a brand because it's for 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 bigger brands the voice is kind of established right now but um, as a younger brand you are just trying to discover it's like a kid trying to discover its identity so let's think about a situation where you imagine you have a voice as a brand but the audience reacts to other stuff you thought about you as being this serious brand but the audience reacts better when you are funnier. How do you 
shift to what the audience wants, also keeping what you think as an owner of a, of a company um, as, as your voice? Yeah, so this is actually a question that um, I have, well, we've tackled as a company like many, for many years with our clients. In fact, um, we have, uh, we've worked with some big brands that were very serious over the years, financial, um, you know, wealth management companies, uh, big, you know, B2B tech companies, law mm -hmm. firms, accountants. This is these are serious business, and they often, like especially on the financial side, they're regulated by compliance, right? You can't you you can't say certain things, you can't joke about certain things, and so we developed uh, this process that we call um, creating a social brand, uh, and it's taking your core brand voice that a lot of companies have built in a boardroom probably with a brand agency many years ago put in one of those pdfs you know do's and don'ts kind of um documents we are all familiar with the brand uh guidelines and we take that and then we do the research on with the audience to see you know what their voice is what they're responding to what you know what's the lingo what's the what are the in jokes that sort of thing and we find a a, a blend that works for that you know it's sort of like creates a sister brand i guess from that core brand so the core brand would be like i don't know like the serious sibling and then the social brand is more of the 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 outgoing sociable interactive uh sibling so you know one's very studious and gets things done and doesn't ever go out and the other one is a you know a little bit more out in 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 the, in the public and um yeah we work really hard on making sure that we're true to the core brand but also have developed a human enough voice you know we have several different um uh parameters so one is we we talk about characteristics so this is the core of what the brand stands for is deep in our character and we have both safe and provocative characteristics so it's not just um we can't just go with like creative <laughs> and <laughs> friendly You know, we also like there's provocative terms like opinionated and um, uh, quirky, you know, like things like that, that are a little like we do want to have because the provocative characteristics around of, of humans are what usually makes us different, unique, likable. You think about uh, the brands that we do tend to look to and like their personality It's because they have something quirky uh, about them. Um, so, you know, those are the safe and provocative. And then on top of that, we build a sense of humor. And as a brand, you have to have a sense of humor. Now, you can have a very dry, sort of serious side of a sense of humor where you don't push it too far, but you have to have a sense of humor. It's sort of like online, it's just, it's, you need it. Right. So something. Um, and then uh, then we create like uh, these different uh, tones. So it's like, what are you what's your sort of day to day tone? And then what happens in a crisis? What happens when you're um, being like you have somebody that's angry at you? What happens if, if there is you have a you've won you like have a win of some sort right you break your sales records how did what's your tone in those moments what's your tone during the election like all of the ways in which you want to create those guidelines for anybody who is picking up your social platforms and writing for them because most brands have outsourced either you know they have a team that does it or mm -hmm. they've outsourced to a freelancer or an agency And this is a good guideline um, for putting out there. And then we make sure that we create examples of do's and don'ts on each of those. Like this is going too far or this is like still a little bit too conservative. So that helps create a voice. And then after a while, you should be able to practice and kind of like 
find it's you know, just a document is not going to create a human lovable voice right so after a while I think you get into the swing of things you start to feel a personality really come to bear just like a human being you know they're born you see a personality emerge in your children as they uh, start to become humans think about that for the brand I think this is this is an important point because as you mentioned humans are doesn't don't have just only one emotion they don't have just one one voice if if you have just one emotion you are very boring so yeah. brands should be more human like that yeah um so um going going a bit to the um, to the research to the insights part um and also to to this need of um to to grow the audience how do you um i don't know compensate the need um for for big numbers on on social uh with with the need of having an authentic conversation because we saw brands investing a lot in in social media but getting getting just numbers not not the community you have mm-hmm. you have the likes you have you have the uh shares the retweets but not exactly uh a community yeah so uh that was part of the issue i think uh in that sort of mid early days when uh brands were coming online and you know here's a little tidbit in history so there was a moment um i would say in in and around 2014 and 15 where I actually had a lot of hope because brands were starting to especially on Facebook at the time think about content in a way that it would be like what creates engagement what are people looking for and brands were investing instead of just in like building their page likes for instance they were investing in engagement and this idea of creating uh content that their audience loved and would engage with and that was creating a lot more interesting i think uh content on facebook from brands and then facebook looked at this and were like wait a minute this means that brands are not are they're like doing this so well that they're cutting back on their advertising budget so they changed the algorithm at that point to reduce the number of brand posts that you would see in a um in the feed to something like you know if you had um like a million followers only 1% of those followers would organically see your posts and they did this and then they also gave the advice to brands stop trying to be like people just be a brand here create ads this is what works you know like that was their advice and i remember sitting there just like feeling kind of horrified that this was where i mean but also understanding facebook has this motivation to make a bunch of money so um watch this happen and then they i think now it's like 0% or something of orga brand a page organic posts uh will show in a feed and now it's 100% paid so brands are not incentivized on those platforms to uh create engagement they're only um incentivized to yell louder so um i think i just completely forgot your original question but there was a point in time where we could have mm-hmm. seen brands shift more to this hey let's build this community of engagement around what we're building on these platforms but the platforms wanted to make more money so they discouraged it and now we are where we're at i think the only one that you know really uh the only platform that you know really uh didn't go in that direction at the time was was twitter so you still see a lot of brands having fun i just recently in the throw of all of the um um lead up to the election and there's still the pandemic and there's the protests and stuff i think it was like the fast food brands um was it burger king that posted the yeah. like 
you know, the, you know, oh, everyone's asking me this and they're like demanding that. And then the other fast food brands got on board and replied. Like it was like these social media managers Mm -hmm. speaking from behind the brand were making the brand a lot more human. And it was very sweet and touching to watch. So there's still that happening. And you and I think we see a lot more of a brand voice on Twitter. That's why I tend to still really like um Twitter because it's you the Twitter still has there's still this opportunity for brands to grow their audience by just organically creating like engaging conversations and um content I want to stick to the subject um about platforms um and uh one of one of the, the things that brands dream is maybe not to be platform dependent because mm. you you will be um you will have to change your your strategy every time uh, a platform changes the algorithm um how do you build something outside social platforms can you build something today natively um on your website on your blog as a community or you um it's almost impossible no i mean i think uh if something has shifted back to community this year because of the need for people to connect um i mean some brands is going to be more successful than others it's not going to work for every brand um i don't i don't know if Burger King, for instance, could build a community <laughs> around Burger King. Maybe, maybe. I mean, they do a good job on Twitter, but I think they're better probably on the platform interacting there. But I see plenty of brands, especially like a, a B2B brands, um, you know, big tech brands. Um, let's say uh, IBM or Microsoft, um, um, even Nokia, our client, like building these uh brands for their partners for instance um to interact and collaborate and learn more about uh different solutions which you know becomes yes there's a bit of an upselling within that community but it's not the core um the core reason for that community to exist is really for your customers and your clients to have this added value and connect with one another um, as well as there's, you know, a bit of support involved. So, you know, a lot of these brands are building, um, you know, there's a whole, I mean, there's so many uh, community platforms out there. Some of the Mm -hmm. traditional ones like our, Um, I think Vanilla Forums uh, has like one of the strongest platforms out there for developers, uh, for anybody who's building a brand around developers. Uh, Discord is coming up the ranks as is uh, Slack when it comes to brand communities. Um, And, um, you know, there's all these other platforms. There's one, I think it's uh, called Tribe, which is not like the original Mm -hmm. Tribe. Um, uh, There are Mighty Networks. There's a whole bunch of different platforms out there where brands could, you know, depending on what they're offering to entice people, are they offering... um, uh, say, for instance, Hootsuite has a great community, but they offer a lot of training and learning through there. And HubSpot, same thing, training mm-hmm. and learning and resources through that. Was, that's what gets people in. And then they find their sort of their tribe, uh, so to speak. Um, but, yeah, there's a ton of different platforms out there. It's And it's just really what you're trying to achieve through creating a community. But I think that first and foremost, you have to ask yourself, like, why am I building a community? Uh, why do I want to build a community? And, you know, what business goal does this help? Because that's gonna, you know, especially if you're selling it into the C-suite, you need to know what your business goal is. But then also, what's in it for the, what's in it for the the customers that arrive? The other what, uh, what are the, um, the, um when when trying to build uh, communities when 
when uh, going social? What are the key insights you are looking for? Uh, well, I mean, when it comes to building a community like of your own, your own sort of platform, um, you know, you're looking for uh, definitely uh, engagement metrics, right? Uh, you know, how many how do how many people log in on a fairly regular basis? What conversations are being started without you having to put in your starter? question right a lot of a lot of early days of building a community for brands will be like brands posting the you know they'll have somebody posting questions and encouraging conversation but you can tell you're successful once those conversations just happen without you inciting them at all uh when people when when your community members uh don't need you to Uh, jump in to get the engagement going that's when you know that you're well on your way to uh, building a strong uh, brand community so for instance like uh, some of the long going uh, I think Microsoft and uh, IBM and a lot of these um, different brands will have communities like developer communities uh, that they can't even keep up with the conversation it's just like the community is taken over and there's been self-appointed moderators now within the community. So they know that they've succeeded in building a strong community when like, it's like, Oh, it's all right. Big brand. We've got this yeah. for you. Um, and all you do as a brand is like, make sure that there's no bad actors in the, in the community at mm -hmm. that point. Um, how often should should you as as a brand change your core marketing strategy? Because we see we see brands maybe uh, changing the voice, the 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 tone um, once or twice a year. But the mm. the big picture strategy, how often should you should you change it? Well, I mean, first of all, I don't think they should be changing their voice. I mean, tone changes all the time with whatever's mm -hmm. happening in the world. But, I mean, your core, who you are, should stay consistent unless it's really not working. <laughs> Once you find something that's working, uh, that consistency matters for your audience. But um, when it comes to your strategy uh, overall, I mean, this is a tough one because um, on one side, you want to find a strategy, get in a stride and stick with it. Because once again, that consistency is really important for um, like building that trust with your customer base. And, you know, that in that consistency is where your brand gets um, reinforced. So, <clears throat> pardon me. If it's if it's good, if it's something that connects with your audience and something that like just feels like it's it's keeping you moving, um, you need to stick with it, and you know, for a long time because it's it's core to who you are. And uh, I think of like a brand um, like uh, Dove right the um real beauty campaign mm -hmm. now they've kind of gone off the rails here and there with it but when they brought out that strategy um it was revolutionary and they led it and they they actually they incited a lot of other beauty brands to start getting real about beauty so they started more of a movement than a strat like it wasn't just a strategy marketing strategy and so they've stuck with it even if they've tried to Uh, adjust it and build on it uh, in various ways over time and it works and it continues to work for their brand and I think they'll um, you know unless they find another movement to like another parade to jump in front of mm -hmm. then you know that's a good strategy to stick with and the tactics may change over time but that core strategy stays the same on the other side of it are brands that may have not completely found that stride in their strategy and they're they're testing things they're testing the waters um you know or they just haven't found their groove yet um and you don't want to 
change too rapidly over time when it comes to that strategy you want to be able to play something out so if you're like this is you know our market this is how we're differentiated because the core of a strategy is like this is who we appeal to this is how we position ourselves to be differentiated from the competition this is why you would choose us this is our approach like our message and um the you know there's everything in there like pricing strategies whatever else within there and then uh this is um where you know everything else is tactics on top of that everything else is and you can change tactics over time but Mm -hmm. the core strategy and like of course this is our mission this is our goal right that's part of it is like this is what we want to achieve or what we want to do which includes bigger missions than just making money of course um so you think of like a Patagonia or whatever, like they've had the same strategy from day one and that's worked for them and they've just changed tactics over time. They've just adapted with the times. Um, but there are the other brands that ha- can't, haven't quite found that or the market changes so drastically. I think about uh, IBM, <clears throat> back to IBM. Uh, they were huge market leader early on, very advanced people built, you know, they built a lot of trust. And then at some point they kind of lost their way, right? They, they kind of seemed stale and people, you know, kind of lost touch with what they were doing. They didn't seem like they were as cutting edge as some of the new brands. And so they had to go back to the drawing board and think, okay, what is our strategy? And that, you know, out of that, they really doubled down on AI and you know watson came out of it and and then you know then they that the their core shifted i mean it didn't completely change <clears throat> and i think of even our our client nokia and they started out i think it was uh making tires <laughs> <laughs> i think that was like the original um company um and if anybody from nokia is listening i'm sorry if i got that wrong but it's something like that and they moved into paper and communications and like shifted. And then they were very famous for mm-hmm. their phones in the 90s. And now they're uh, a leader in 5G technology for um, CSPs and operators mm-hmm. and uh, you know putting huge infrastructure, more B2B side of things. So they've shifted over time with the times, but kept kind of that same that same thread which is like connecting people from day one Mm -hmm. so um i know that's a very convoluted answer to your very simple question but (laughs) i think a strategy does not you know if you shift too much you're going to never get that that flywheel um and by flywheel like this is a term um that uh, we borrowed from for our company but uh, you'll never get that flywheel going, um, but you know, brands take time to build, um, and that's what a strategy should be about: is like building uh, your trust and reputation with, uh, and growing and growing that trust and reputation over time. And how you do that, like, if, so if you change who you are or you change like course too many times, you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to get that flywheel going. Finally, because we are um, uh, getting uh, at the end of uh, this episode of the Curious Ryan podcast, I want to switch from brands to uh, public authorities, to governments, to municipalities, because we see um, during this pandemic, not just a health crisis, but in some areas, in some countries, a crisis of communication. Uh, and also we know this fact that it's it's very hard, it, maybe it's easier to grow a community around the brand, but around a country you have different ideologies, different opinions, it's uh, people are fighting more. So how, how does a, a government, let's say, build this community online? It has citizens, but... How do they do they right. uh, meet in the middle online? Well, I mean, we're the, I think the biggest crisis we have is a crisis of trust in our institutions. And I, you know, I think through throughout this conversation, I keep bringing up this idea of trust. 
Um, And trust is, it it really is fundamental to where we put our attention, uh, where we put our money, (laughs) um, where we put our votes. Um, Trust is so fundamental. And um, I think uh, what we've seen definitely, and and it isn't, you know, only with what's happening in the U.S., there has been a breakdown in trust in our institutions for many years. And, you know, there's been many people uh, working at whittling away at that, not just government. So, I mean, um, the media um, is, you know, we certainly there are politicians who say don't trust the media, but uh, the media has done some untrustworthy things prior to that that opened them up for criticism, uh, including clickbait and all that stuff that's trying to... Um, uh, trying to appeal to our our limbic zone that little lizard brain and and get us all riled up and you know the if it bleeds it leads right that kind of thing just to get the clicks just to get our attention um which of course then you know you click through and then it's like oh well that story doesn't match the headline so we're already kind of shaken there um you know governments definitely have um as you talk about you know shaken our trust by not communicating uh, by keeping deals behind closed doors by you know making decisions based on lobbyists um, and making um, decisions based on wanting to keep power versus what's doing what's right um and um really you know if you voted for somebody because they promised something in a platform and then they don't follow through i you know i'm in canada and uh one of the um you know i i worked for our prime minister (laughs) i i was part Mm -hmm. of his original campaign not the federal campaign but his uh liberal leadership campaign and uh in that federal campaign he promised to reform um um elections and then he didn't follow through he was like oh people don't really care about that (laughs) (laughs) we did care about that Mm -hmm. and it stuck with us and so he lost his majority in his second term and people i think are really still sore about that right so making promises and not keeping them and not keeping that open is is very damaging. Um, so yeah, there's the communication. I don't know if it's just online because that in and of itself is a way sometimes for politicians, for organizations to hide behind um, digital forums to create crafted messages. Um, It really is about creating, I guess this, uh, you know, being authentic and not like putting on authenticity, but being authentic and open. And, you know, um, as uh, you know, I think of somebody who's becoming a rock star or who has become a rock star in the U S Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC. and what what people love about her is is how much she communicates at every instance um, without needing to craft a message. You know, she's even if they, she's saying something that somebody doesn't like, she's saying what she believes and she puts that out there. You know, she's she's being real. She's not being coat. Well, I'm sure she's now being coached a little bit, but. The reason that she resonated so strongly with um, the, you know, the next generation of voters and even, you know, old generation of voters like myself is just like, I'm not, I can't vote in the U.S., but if I would, it would be for AOC. Um, You know, it's just that, like, she's not afraid of losing power by saying the wrong thing. She rose to power because she's like, no, this is what I think is right and I'm going to keep um, saying it and I'm not going to change it because some lobbyist has paid me money to like tamper my message and you know that at the end of the day I don't care what forum or technology or TikTok or whatever you use mm-hmm. that is the core the core to it it's always been the core to good communications Tara thank you thank you very much for for this for this conversation 
and for being here with us at the Curious Ryan podcast. Thank you for having me, Vlad. And to all the people who listen to us, thank you very much. Um, if you listen to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform, you can contact us and tell us what you think. Maybe you saw it on YouTube. So let us a comment. Thank you very much.